it's a great privilege to be able to, in this season, to talk about God's heart for us, and I hope you'll be blessed and continue to be blessed as we spend time together. What a wonderful atmosphere of worship this morning, wasn't that? Right? Just the honor of, that we could bring to the Lord here. I really want to encourage those of you who are tuning online that you'd consider coming uh, and being in the room. There's nothing like being in the room as we really just worship uh, the Lord together and as a community. Um, you know, I want to start by talking a little bit about hope. Uh, hope is something that we think about very rarely, but hope is something that's absolutely necessary in our lives. Uh, what is hope? Hope is that expectation of a future, and it's a hope or a desire and expectation of something good that will come to pass in the future. You see, without hope, we actually don't have anything that takes us forward. Without hope, we don't have anything that drives us to want to do something good. Without the desire for hope uh, that drives us, that believes that tomorrow can be better, we actually will stop even existing. So, so hope is absolutely necessary. Uh, but we don't think so much about it, right? We don't think, do I have any hope? Uh, because as long as it exists, we tend to just move from day to day, thing to thing, season to season. Maybe for some of you right now, you're hoping for certain things. You're, many of us are hoping that this COVID thing will end. Can I get a good amen? amen. Yeah, right? So we hope that this you know, season of uh, both distraction and you know, a lot of inconvenience will start to change. Um, we'll be able to come back to uh, a new season uh, of what God has intended for all of us. Uh, maybe for you, it's a work situation and you're hoping that as the year ends, next year you get a better manager. Don't say amen too loudly. You know, but maybe that's your hope. You know, you have some sort of a new season ahead, a new manager. Uh, maybe there's a difficulty and you're just hoping that the difficulty will go away in a new year. Maybe for some of you, it's a hope of marriage in the coming year. Maybe it's a, a, a hope of, uh, you know, a, a, a restored relationship. Maybe it's a hope that the ch child that's giving you a lot of headache right now will change attitude. Also, don't say amen too loudly. Maybe for some of you, it's as simple as, I hope this sermon is not too long. But we all have these hopes. Um, and uh, I want to tell you about a, a guy, his name is Viktor Frankl. Uh, and Viktor Frankl was someone who wrote about hope because he had to live through a season when hope disappeared. And when it seemed that hope would disappear. And that's how we know that hope is absolutely necessary for us. Because when hope is taken away, literally, life is taken away from us. You know, when people come to a sense of hopelessness, when they feel that there's nothing that can change in their lives, so often that becomes a factor in depression. It becomes a factor in suicide. When we lose hope, it is almost as though there is no reason to keep going on. And that, that's why hope is so vital. You know, Viktor Frankl, he uh, lived through the Second World War and he ended up in a, incarcerated in one of those concentration camps in Auschwitz. And he noticed this. He was a psychologist by training. And he, through this difficulty and through the starvation and through the brutality that they experienced, uh, he started to notice some things. He noticed that the fittest people weren't necessarily the people who survived. Uh, the people who were strong weren't necessarily the people who survived. And through this experience, he writes in this book, Man's Search for Meaning, this very powerful thought. He said this, he discovered that those who had hope were able to get through the pain, the suffering, the absolute inhumanity that they experienced. It was hope that kept them going. It was not strength. It was not capacity. It was not giftedness. It was not smarts but it was that deep sense of hope. See, we all need hope. The world needs hope, especially right now, with so much that seems to be going wrong. However, our hope is not often enough. Because when we use the word hope, we tend to use it as a sense of wishful thinking. For instance, you may hope the sermon is short but you cannot control it. There is no certainty that this sermon will be short. You can hope that your child's attitude will change, but there is no certainty of that. So we wish that would happen. You can hope that you will get married in the coming year, but there is no certainty of that. 
And that's why a lot of our hope still is short-lived. It's insufficient to get us through the darkest days, to give us a strength and a motivation to keep going on through the years ahead. But biblical hope is quite different. When the Bible talks about hope, the Bible is looking at a hope as an act of certainty, not an act of wishfulness. The reason we can have hope is because we need to place our hope not in uh, temporary things. We need to place our hope in eternal things. And it's when our hope is in the word of God and not in the wishes of man that we can have a certainty. When our hope is not based on our feelings, but on his certainty, then we can have an anchor. And so if you're wondering, what is it we should have hope in? How is it we should have a hope that can get us through challenge and difficulty and even a lifetime of pain and suffering? I pray that today, that God will speak to each one of us and give us a strong, deep sense of hope, a certainty, not wishful thinking, but a certainty into tomorrow. We're going to start by looking at a letter that Paul writes to a leader. His name is Titus. And Titus is leading this church, and uh, as the church starts to grow, Paul realizes that they've got some things missing. So he says, you need to get, get some elders and some leaders and start to put them in place and get the right leaders over this. And then he starts to write this letter and says that you need to teach sound doctrine to this group of people. Make sure that they know the Word of God well. And so we're going to pick up from a little bit of the second chapter of this letter that Paul is writing to Titus. And it says this, Paul says to Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. What is Paul doing? He's saying this, he's saying, remember that God's grace has been seen because of Jesus' first coming. Last week, we talked a little bit about that. What is the power of the incarnation to bring hope and to bring love so that we can love one another? And so this has already taken place. We're looking behind the past. It has happened. His grace has come. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Then he says this, now waiting for our blessed hope. Everybody say blessed hope. If you're tuning in online, would you write in the chat, blessed hope. You see, here's what Paul says, that there is a hope that is blessed. There is a kind of hope that's different from the kind of hope that you and I experience in our day to day. It's not just wishing, but it's going to be a blessing. In fact, some of this translation just says you're going to be happy because you have this type of hope. Anybody would like to be happy these days? Right, there's lots of bad things going on. Right, we can choose to be happy. So this is the hope that we need, this blessed hope that will take us into all of tomorrow. What is it? The hope is this. It's the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul says. We need to have an understanding of the grace that's come because of Christmas but we need to have a hope that is established because of his second return. That's what Paul is saying. If our hope is only on this side of eternity, it is insufficient. It will shift, it will change. It is like water that will come and go or the tides that will come and go. It's like sand that starts to shift. But when our hope is in his second imminent return, then we can have an anchor. We can have a confidence. We can know for sure that when he returns, that is our hope. That is how and who we place our hope in. So let me give you just the thought that I have for us today. It's very simple. Let Christ's second coming anchor our hope. Let Christ's second coming, his return again, anchor our hope. Now, I don't know whether you think very much about Jesus' second coming. If you do, my guess is most of us think about when, uh, 
When is Jesus going to come back? Is he coming back now? You know, that all got his problem, right? Is this the sign of the end? So we get very curious about the ending and the signs of the ending and when it's going to happen. And there's lots that we can discuss and lots that can happen. However, if we do that, sometimes we can miss and get distracted of the key truth, which is this. He is coming back. The when is secondary. The when is not as important, but the reality, the truth of his return, the the absolute confidence that he is coming is what we need to establish in our hearts because we will live differently if we live with an awareness that he is returning. And that's why this series is called Incoming. Because what we did in part one is we looked back into the future, or back into the future, we looked back into the past, and we looked at his first incoming at Christmas, right? That incarnation. Today, we're going to look forward at his second incoming when he returns. And next week, we're going to look at what happens in his incoming in the in-between. And so I hope you will come back and you will tune in or you will join us as we continue on this journey. So here's what we need to know, that Jesus' return is absolutely imminent. It is going to happen. His promise is true. If you recognize the first coming of Jesus at Christmas, then all the prophecies that proclaim that, scholars tell us that there's so many more prophecies that speak about his second coming. If it is true that Jesus came that first time as a baby, he shall return again. And you and I need to have absolute confidence that this return is going to happen. Whether it happens in our lifetimes or not is actually secondary. It is true that he will return. And there are three things I want to look at today in, 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 the, in the light of his second coming. What does it mean when Jesus returns? Three things, revelation, resolution, and resurrection. Because I hear that three things are powerful, and I hear that if you alliterate it, it must be anointed. So we have a powerful anointed message coming up. Can I get a good amen? Amen. Okay. They said amen. I hope you say amen uh, as well. What is one of the things that happens when Jesus returns? The first thing is that we have a revelation of who he is. We will no longer see him from a distance. We will no longer experience him as a still small voice. If you have ever felt as a Christian, I just wish Jesus will come and visit me. He will. And he will return bodily. It is not a spiritual return. He will return bodily. You and I will witness him and we will see him. And if you've ever wondered, how come it's so hard to hear his voice? You know, I've got to learn how to discern the prompting of the Holy Spirit right now. There will come a day when his voice will be absolutely clear. You will hear his voice. He will return. There will be a revelation, and the revelation will be, this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen, there are many texts, but we'll just look at one. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. There will be a shaking, an awareness, almost a fear, a sense of awe that will come over humanity, and they will see. Who is the they? All the tribes of the earth. Everybody will see him. And what will they see? They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There will come a time when Jesus returns and everybody will see who he is. And the only response at that point is what we are learning to do right now, to bow our knees and say, he is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. There is no greater name. There is no higher name. You know, his returning will give us the encounter that we long for. And I hope it's something we long for. You see, sometimes when we think of his return, we tend to think of it with fear, right? Like, oh, Jesus is coming. Better get my act together. True. Better get your act together. But, you know, I think we miss the heart of his return. You see, if you recognize that Jesus has come, And he lived on this earth and he took your sin and my sin and he has redeemed us eternally because of his great love for each and every one of us. Then surely something in you and me must long to want to see him, to want to meet him, to want to know him, not just through the pages of scripture, but now we can know him in all the fullness of his 
glory. There must be something in us that says, actually, the relationship that I want more than any other relationship is to see Jesus. I can't wait to get into glory, you know, because a couple of people I want to meet, you know, I don't know if you ever think about this, but the couple of people I'd like to, I'd like to meet Peter, and I want to shake his hands, because I'm say, Peter, thank you. Thank you for being a bumbling idiot. It gave me a lot of hope. Right? And though you made a lot of mistakes because of all the things you said, it gave me hope that God could also use a bumbling idiot like me. Uh, I'd like to meet Timothy. Right? I'd like to know a little bit about Timothy. Uh, I want to figure out this whole Melchizedek thing. Right? I, I wouldn't mind kind of doing that. Uh, there are a couple of people I want to meet, and I want to know about you know, uh, their situation. I, I want to meet Paul for sure, because one of the questions I want to have for Paul is, what was the thorn? What is this thorn? You know, all that we humanity, right? we argue, argue, discuss. I want to know from you, Paul, what is the thorn of the flesh? On the side. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's okay. But there are a couple of people I'd like to meet when I get to heaven. But you know what? Besides all those people, the one, the one that in my heart is the longing of all is I want to see Jesus. He's the one who died for me. I want to meet him. I want to see his face. I want to give him all the glory. You know, like, I, I, this is mine and don't quote me. I don't, don't know how it sits theologically, but I, I would like to sing a duet with Jesus. You know, I really do. I think sometimes I wonder what Jesus' voice is like when he sings. You know, like, I would love that. I would love to just see him and know him and hear his voice and worship him into all of eternity. You know, what we did this morning was so incredible, right? Something in my heart was leaping as we were praising God. And I thought, wow, this is just a tiny little glimpse, a tiny little echo of the real expression of joy and worship that we have. Because why? We don't just have to acknowledge the presence by the Spirit of God. We now have Jesus in our midst. There is no sun because He will be the brightness of it all. His name greater than any other name. He is the King on the throne. You see, His second coming shouldn't be scary. Because you and I should know him now, and we long to have that encounter with him in all of its fullness. You know, I, I think a helpful illustration is um, recently, I, I think over the last couple of years, there have been these stories of soldiers who have gone overseas, and then they come back and they surprise their loved ones. Have you seen any of these videos? If you never, I suggest later, not right now, later, go to YouTube and just, you know, soldier return, a surprise. Uh, and you'll just sit there and you'll end up bawling for about a good half hour, right? Because it's incredible. You, you have these uh, families and the soldiers leave their family and they go and they fight this war. And while they are away, the family gets to interact with them via video conferencing, right? So they kind of have a little bit of conversation and all that. And then suddenly, the family's not aware. The father returns or the mother returns. And when the soldier returns, there's this incredible joy of running and seeing the soldier who's returned. The incredible joy of a parent who received the soldier, a, a child who receives the father or the mother. You've seen these videos, right? I was going to show one, but then I thought I'm going to end up crying and then sermon finish, you know? But I thought this could be a simple analogy of that great day when he comes and we go out to meet him and we welcome him to this earth because now the rightful king has come and the rightful king is my big brother. He is my savior and he is my God. I wonder if we have such a powerful realization of this revelation that we now have an anchor, an anchor of hope in spite of all the brokenness that we can experience, in spite of all the other longings that we put on this side of eternity, perhaps it will shift when we say that actually I long for him. I long for him. You know, at the end of the book of Revelation, the last words are, come, Lord Jesus. Would we, God's people, who today have an, uh, an encounter with him, who have a, a connecting with him, who have his words given to us, would we be so longing that he would come back? Because today we, make, we connect with the Lord through, through veils, through, through limits. 
but one day we won't. What a joyful hope that will be when he returns. Revelation. The second thing is resolution. You know, it's not difficult to know that the world is messed up. There's a lot of brokenness going on around. Families are broken. Societies are broken. Churches have, you know, brokenness in it. And when we think of all of that, it can seem overwhelming. It can seem like, what do we do? How do we fix this? But the glorious good news we have at his second incoming is that he is going to put everything right. Everything. Every wrong will be made right. You know, today, um, a fairly significant buzzword is the word justice. Right? Like everybody talks about justice. You know, you've got to have justice in this and justice in that. And any form of difference is, you know, justice. For instance, it's unjust for me to be standing on a platform and you to be sitting on the floor. It's inequality. Maybe I should sit down. No, it's just oh, the camera has a difficult time. But when we think of justice, especially the concept of social justice. It is about distributive justice. We think about the need for everything to be equal. And there is value in that, but that's not biblical justice. Uh, Dr. Vodi Bokum was very helpful to me in understanding some of this difference. You know, social justice is really about distributing and making sure the power and equality is there. But biblical justice is basically this. Anything that does not abide or, 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 or fulfill the law of God and the ways of God is injustice. Anything that's against God's way and God's law is injustice. So there's so much going on in our world that is wrong. And sometimes we can think about all the things going wrong, and the question sometimes people ask me is, if there is a good God, why is it He allows these things to go on? There is a time period for it. Maybe right now it seems that things that are unjust seem to carry on, but one day, that's the certainty we have. He will come back, and when he comes back, he will come back as a judge. And he will judge the nations. Everything that is wrong will be made right. There will come a shalom, a peace into our world never experienced ever. A, a kind of shalom, even this morning as a team, as we were preparing, we read through Isaiah chapter 9. And, and in this, uh, you know, is it 9 or 11? 11. 11, Isaiah 11. And as we read through that, in this picture, it's a picture of what? It's a picture of lion and the lamb. It's a picture of a child sitting next to a cobra. Any of you today will put your child next to a cobra? Don't ha. Huh? Heaven come yet. But there will come a peace, a shalom, where nature itself will be made right. Where the world will be put right. When Jesus returns, every wrong will be made right. Listen to what Revelation 19 says of his return. Then I saw heaven open, and I is John here, and behold a white horse. His first coming, he came as a vulnerable, helpless baby. His second coming, he will come back as the commander and chief of the Lord's army. He will come back on a white horse to bring vindication and justice to the nation. Everything that was wrong will be put right. Anytime you have felt that there's some you know, brokenness in this world, why is it people are doing this? Why is it governments are doing this? Why is it there seems to be all this wrong? All of that will be put right when Jesus comes back. He's going to come back as the ruling king to take his rightful place. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness, he judges and makes war. All his enemies will be subjugated. There will be no more war. If we have a certainty of his ability to put everything right, then you and I can walk in shalom today. 
You and I don't have to say, I need my vindication felt today. That's why we can be quick to forgive and forgive and forgive. Every pain, every injustice, every mistreatment will be made right in Christ Jesus. If you look at Revelation 22, it says this, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. What does that word mean? It means this, when Jesus returns, he's going to restore, he's going to make amends for everything that was wrong. I wish we understood this truth more and more because that's where our hope can be. A God who's going to come and fix everything. Have you ever experienced something that doesn't work in your life? It's very disconcerting, right? Like you, how la? I will share one story. Not too long ago, I got an SOS from my parents, uh, from my dad particularly. My dad requested that I drop everything and I come home. Now, my parents are in their 80s, so I thought, "Uh uh-oh, major problem, health issue, better go and see what's happening. So I was trying to figure out what what was the situation. Here was the situation. My dad accidentally deleted my mom's WhatsApp. This was a tragedy. This caused everything within this household to now fall apart because my mom had no way of receiving WhatsApp messages. And you know how important those are. So there was all this problem that needed to be fixed, and they did not know what to do. They did not know how to solve it themselves. They, they tried various things, and they did not know what to do. So they needed to get somebody to come and fix it. And so they called me, and one of the things you'll discover as a growing child is you were cute when you were young. You were full of hope and potential as you grew up, and then you became an adult child, and then you just fixed things. I am the IT support. Uh, fix things in the house the best I can. But I went there and looked at it, and in a few moments, downloaded the new app, everything solved. There was shalom that came again. There's so much in our world that's broken that we don't have the capacity to fully figure out how to fix. But when we have the confidence that when he comes, he will fix everything, then we can walk with shalom today. Let his second coming anchor our hope. There is revelation of who he is. There's resolution of all that's wrong. And the third is this. There is the resurrection of the dead. The Christian hope is not that we go to heaven. The Christian hope is that the dead in Christ will come back alive forevermore. That's the Christian hope. It is not that we are disembodied spirits that exist in some spiritual plane, but that we too will be glorified and we too will have a perfected body and we will return with Christ on this earth as Jesus makes the new heaven and the new earth. Let's look at one passage, Revelation 19. No, this is Corinthians. Sorry, I think the, the reference is incorrect. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying this. Paul is saying that this Jesus who died on the cross is now resurrected. And he is the first fruit. What does it mean? It means this. He's like the forerunner. Because of his resurrection, we too will be resurrected. So he is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, Adam, and by man has also come the resurrection of the dead. By Adam, everybody died. Because of Jesus, everybody is going to be resurrected again. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ will come back bodily. That is our hope. Our hope is not that we will be on a cloud somewhere in heaven playing a harp, singing some hill song. 
Our hope is that we, even though we die because we're in Christ, we will be resurrected and be given a glorified body to come and rule and reign with King Jesus on the earth as the new Jerusalem on this earth. Jesus Christ's resurrection is evidence and proof for us that this is a certainty. If I look at another text, it says this, having a hope in God with, uh, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Meaning what? Everybody is going to resurrect. Everybody, believer and unbeliever, will resurrect. And in that resurrection, there will come a judgment. The judgment of the way that you have chosen to live and the choices that you have made. That must be our hope. Our hope is not just of healing and restoration on this side of eternity. Our hope is that one day we will be forever resurrected. And when we are in Christ and in that resurrection, we will forever be perfected. Let me tell you a story, a, a true story. And there's historical uh, documents that tell us of this story. And it happens uh, with a Jewish community who are now revolting against the Romans. So the Romans were in charge, and they were very abusive to the Jews. And so the Jews decide to revolt. And so in this Jewish revolt, there was a lot of clash that happened. And in this one particular episode, there, there is a mother who has seven sons. And the Roman soldiers take the seven sons, and they start to torture them. And this torture is incredible. There's details of this torture. What happens is they take the oldest son, and what they do is they start to boil oil. So the oil is boiling, and while the oil is boiling, they take the oldest son and they chop off his tongue. Because he refuses to eat pork. They say, you better eat pork. And they say, no. The reason is because they trusted the law of Moses, which at that point said that uh, you know, pork would be an unclean meat to eat. Right? And so they chop off his tongue, and then they scrape off his hair. So they peel his scalp, and then they chop his hands, and they chop his feet. And then they take him, and they drop him into boiling oil, all in front of the brothers and in front of the mother. This is what the second brother says. You butcher, you may kill us, but the king of the universe will raise us from the dead and give us eternal life because we have obeyed his laws. Why is it they were able to withstand that kind of treatment? It's because they had a strong understanding and conviction that even though on this side of eternity you may destroy me, but on that day I will come back. On that day, Jesus will raise me from the dead. And into all of eternity, I will be okay because I have trusted him and I've been faithful to follow his ways. You see, what gets us through the darkest times, what gets us through hope is this, is knowing the resurrection is going to take place. Then what happens to the second brother, the, the second son? They do the same thing. They start to torture him. So they scrape off his head and they peel off his hair. And the second son says this, go ahead, chop off my hands, don't waste time. Why? He says this, God gave these, my hands, to me, but his laws mean more to me than my hands and I know God will give them back to me. Wow. And every one of those sons gets killed and the mother witnesses all of this. But her hope is knowing that these sons will one day be fully resurrected. Do you understand how important this hope is? Because you see, if you've ever had a sickness and you prayed and you believe that God would heal and God can and God does, but we also know of many times when God chooses not to, how do we continue to have a hope? The hope is this, in that in that resurrection, all the sickness is gone. You know, if you're a parent and you've had a child who's had to go through difficulty, who's had a medical issue, who's been sick, and you prayed and you trusted God and did all these things, and we continue to do that. We continue and come back next week because we're going to talk about the in-between. What do we do in the in-between? But our hope cannot just be on the here and now. Our hope must be to know that one day this child will no longer have any pain 
This child will no longer have any disability. This child will no longer have anything that causes, that allows the disease to ravage their body. If you have suffered any kind of physical sickness, the hope of this resurrection is that in Christ, it is gone. There will be no disease. And you know what? Because of this resurrection, death is swallowed up in his victory. Death will not exist anymore. That's the glorious good news of knowing Christ and walking with him. There is the hope of his resurrection. And when this takes place, you and I will be in glory. If I can't wait. You know, like, as I share, the only thing thinning in my life right now is my hair. And I look forward to the day when it it's just different because all the ravages of old age and aging disappear. And we see him for all he is and he puts everything right and we are fully restored, body, soul, and spirit. So when Jesus returns, we will see him for who he is. He will put everything right and we will be resurrected from the dead. So it's real simple. Let Christ's second coming anchor our hope. So what, what should we do? It's, it's really simple. Last week I said, be in Christ today. Put your hope in God. Don't put your hope in yourself. Don't put your hope in your work. Don't put your hope in the somehow I wish things would just change. Put your hope in the certainty of His second coming. Now it doesn't mean you just hope in the second coming and then we don't have to do anything now. Come back next week. We'll talk a little bit more. But let the hope be in knowing King Jesus is who he said he is. As we kind of wrap up, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And we're just going to sing that song and that verse in that song that Sarah picked for us today that declares that when he returns, he will come back clothed in white And I want you to imagine that day when Jesus comes back, the glorious hope that we have to praise Him and to worship Him into all of eternity. because I will rise with the saints and I am transfixed because it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And my only right response will be praise the name of the Lord. Oh, praise you, God. Would you stand as we just worship Him for a few moments, as we reenact and rehearse His return, as we declare Praise the one who is deserving of it all. You shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. Okay. 